Hey everybody, welcome to this week's live stream. I hope you're all doing good today. So we're pushed back one day because I had a birthday party for my nephew to go to. So didn't want to miss that and didn't want to, you know, have to like reschedule for next week. So we're doing a little bit of a Sunday stream. It should be pretty fun. So today we're going to turn up that pen blank. Uh, one of the, this is a sample of it, uh, one of the experiments that we made. And so this was one of the ones from the first experiment stream that we did. So we uh, we're, we're mixing in some dye uh, plus some micas. Uh, and that was the one where we, we dumped them together in like a dirty pour. Um, so we would, uh, you know, we have three colors in this blank. We have purple, uh, it's actually blurple, um, green and yellow. And so what we did was we mixed up six cups. We had a gold uh, mica and then we had a yellow dye that was transparent. And then we had the blurple plus a purple uh, dye, transparent. And then uh, the, what's the other color? Green and uh, uh, in a mica and then a green uh, see-through. And so what we did was we mixed up six cups and then dumped the dye. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, I don't think. But dumped one of the, the greens, you know, dumped the, the green dye into the mica and then just gave it a little swirl. And so effectively, we only technically poured three colors at a time into the mold, but we should have some dye transparent areas plus the mica, which will kind of give the blank a little bit of a depth, uh, give those colors some depth, give you some different color variations in the blank, hopefully. That's kind of what we were going for. So we were experimenting with that. It's something that I've just really never, um, you know, like I've mixed dyes in with mica powders, but separately in the past, you know, so it's not like I haven't mixed transparent dyes with micas, but uh, I've never done a dirty pour like that where you're just, just trying to kind of alter that color. So it should be pretty fun. This was again, one of the, the first ones from that first stream. And then we also did on the second one, uh, we did it where we were pouring each individually. So we actually poured all six cups um, using the same colors. So should be pretty cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. So let's uh, head to the overhead. Here we go. We got this thing set up and we also have the other half on the, the lathe. I've got, um, we're gonna be going with a, uh, a, a cigar style pen kit. It's just a chrome. I thought it'd look good with these colors. Let me, let me get the camera situated a little bit better. Maybe a little bit of zoom going here. Um, we got a couple other little announcements before we start turning. I think I need to turn the light down just a little bit more. So we got it ready to go though. And with these, I kind of blobbed the colors more. Um, typically on most of the blanks that I'm pouring um, vertically, I do a little bit more of like, you know, like striations rather than, but what I wanted to do is try to really see um, thicker, very, you know, thicker bands of the mica dye mixture. So we can kind of see how that uh, plays together. So uh, it should be pretty cool. It's a good looking pen, good looking blank. So we got a couple announcements. We got some uh, new patrons that I wanted to give a shout out to. Uh, let's see here, let me get my list. We got Tim Costello. He's one of the new guys uh, over there on Patreon. We got Lou Call and we have Bart Day. So big thank you to everybody that supports the show over on Patreon. Uh, and that actually makes me think we need to do uh, an impromptu live uh, hangout sometime with patrons. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, I'm not gonna just dump it on you guys. I'll give you guys a little head, heads up, a little notice, but um, maybe next week, uh, I'll have to kind of look at my schedule, but I will let everybody know on Patreon when we do that. It's, uh, it's been a little while since we've done that. I thought it'd be kind of fun to hang out. I'll have to kind of come up with something to maybe talk about or do, but, uh, that's a good opportunity. If anybody has questions about anything, uh, or, you know, whatever, if you have any topics, bring them to that. So anyway, again, thank you to everybody that is the new, new patrons. I like it. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to share. So uh, on Monday through Wednesday, I went down to Turner's Warehouse. I'm wearing their shirt again. <laughs> um, and it was uh, strictly because I wanted to get a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with Chad uh, for uh, the kitless pens. Um, so I've been kind of, you guys have seen, I've, I've talked about it a lot. Um, and we did, uh, you know, a cap uh, on the last stream. Uh, but, you know, I've been doing my own thing, kind of, I, I, I watched a video, Jim Hines did a, uh, like a demonstration at Turner's Warehouse, which they have a video of um, on their, the Turner's TV YouTube channel. And so I watched that, I've done, I've gotten into this a little bit before, so that was a little bit of a refresher. 
and uh, been doing my own thing kind of in my own shop. And so the tough thing about that is I'm the only critic, you know, <laughs> like, and I have nothing to compare it to uh, my work basically. So, and I had a ton of questions, like little minor things that I didn't want to just have to, that, that are a lot of times easier to show somebody like, oh, how, do, how does this work? Um, so got some one-on-one -on -one time with Chad. It was awesome. The other thing that I got out of that was he went through and showed me how to use a metal lathe to do the machining operations, you know, the drilling, the tapping, all that kind of stuff. Uh, in addition to actually, we kind of played around with even tapering, like the shaping of, of the blanks, but basically kind of an overview on the metal lathe because I have one uh, that I didn't, I didn't realize we, well, I thought it was maybe messed up. The spindle might've been kind of messed up. So I just kind of wrote it off and then, uh, but I was like, oh, I think we can maybe, even if it is kind of, if, if there's a problem, we can probably fix it and maybe I'll start using that a little bit. So I got a little overview and during the process, we actually just made a pen. Uh, that's ob that's the, the kind of obvious easy way to do it. And so here, let's see, get it this way. Here is the pen that we made. Let me get on, on camera here. And I brought some blanks down. This is a new blank that I'm probably gonna be unleashing. It still needs a little bit of tweakage, I think, but it's pretty sweet. And I think this is the first blank. I think we're gonna run like maybe on Instagram. Um, I think we might run like a, a what, what should we name the blank kind of thing. I never do that. And I thought that would be kind of fun to have other people participate and we'll kind of, get a cool name for this thing but uh so like i said chad did the machining uh on it he he you know he was operating the the metal lathe um and then i did the shaping on this one and uh it's pretty cool i got a couple of little little tips and tricks going on um he gave me the the nib so basically it was kind of like i brought him a pen uh to, to keep um, I wanted to kind of get some some feedback on it. It was one of my best I felt and so um, He kind of gave me this one in a sense. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun We we quickly just tested out the nib. That was another thing that he did uh, I asked him if he could kind of give me a you know How do you tune a nib and make sure that everything's you know um, Working correctly on it. And so he went through that a little bit with me um, Just kind of quick. Um, so we, we dipped it in ink, but we didn't actually um, you know ink ink it up. We didn't even put a converter in, uh, mainly because I was flying home and I didn't want to have to just clean it out right away. So I thought, let's ink this up and uh, see how it writes. Now, the only problem is I don't have any good paper. Um, the one thing about fountain pens is they do a lot better with better paper. So this one's got decent paper. It's not, it's not amazing. I think it's probably better than some of the other stuff that I've got though. So I, that's the next thing on my list is I want to get some decent paper. Um, but let's see, let me stop real quick and see who was here first. Clyde was here and then Mark and Kim and Dominic's here. Paul's in uh, Kauai. Nice. Well, he's having a good Sunday. Who else is here? Tim's here. Nice. And Lex. Yeah, hot rod is exactly what I thought of. So uh, I don't know if I can share this. Let's see. My inspiration for that blank, and we're not we're not doing the the thing right now, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to try to see if I can share my screen somehow. Um, go to keep. So and it's actually it's interesting. So uh, Hawaii magma kind of was actually my inspiration. So let me see if I can share this screen. Desktop. Mm, hold on a sec, hold on. See if I can get this. There it is. You know, so like the magma, the black, and then that you got like kind of orangish red and then like a gold. And so that was kind of my you know, and I was looking at all these these different little pictures here. That was kind of my what I was going for. I think I would maybe need to go a lot more black on this to get a little bit more like like this kind of stuff. I, I don't know. Um, but you know, the 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 thing is, uh, we got a pretty cool looking blank, and it, it does totally remind me of a hot rod. Let me actually switch back over to the overhead. 
Um, and, and one interesting thing, so, you know, almost all the time, we polish the heck out of blanks, right? And what we did here was I, we, we, we sanded this up to, you know, like, I don't know, 400. And I was like, you know, maybe, maybe let's try to go for a matte finish. And so, <laughs> you know, the nice thing is, well, number one, I will say, I think I'm a big fan of matte finishes. Um, they just feel the, the, the texture of it, the feeling in your hand is just, I don't know, it's silky smooth. I really love it. Now, you know, glossy pens. Now here's, I finished this one up. Actually, I didn't get this thing. Let's see if we can get the threads there. Right, there we go. So this is the one that we were working on the cap. You know, and it's and it looks great. I love glossy pens. However, it I actually prefer the feel of this mat. And so all we did was just sand it up to 600 grit <laughs> and then quit. And so, you know, I mean, that's an easy way to uh, save a lot of time. Um, when you get to the 600 grit, you want to just make sure there's no big scratches. Just give it a really kind of light um, sanding, especially like up and down, um, but very light. And that's all we did with this thing. Uh, but here's that, like I said, here's that other one. Really happy. It's so shiny. It's hard to actually get a good shot of it on here. I love this. This is this is. I got to be honest. This is one of my favorite blanks that I've ever made. So I'm probably gonna. I'm gonna do a little tweaking on this just to make sure that, like how I pour it is correct. Because like on the back, it's super black. Like there's really not much color. So I want to try and see if I can pour a few more and and get it a little bit more even. But um, got that one done, but it looks like so. On the last stream, we were talking about it. It's, it's Maki E. Uh, it was the technique, the Japanese art technique that I was thinking of. Um, that's actually what JC CJ was was saying, but he he didn't write it right. So anyway, there's that. Let's let's ink this thing up. So I got a, a sample kit from um, Goulet Pens. Um, this one's Pelican Edelstein. Let's see. Let me get this thing right. Pelican. I don't know how to say half of these things. Pelican Edelstein Mandarin is the ink that I'm using here. So let me get a converter in the back of this guy. Um, I just thought like kind of a reddish orange ink would be appropriate. So the way these work, you just use these little converters. Um, you can also use the cartridges. Do I have one of those? And they, they're easier if you're just getting started and don't want to mess around with ink and all this, you know, craziness. Um, the, um, the little ink cartridges are, are super simple and you don't have to worry about like inking it up and doing all that. You would just pop this thing in the back, you know, and you just, you just shove it on until it pops onto the back of the nib and that's all you got to do. But I thought I want to get into this whole ink thing. So let me, first thing, we'll put our, our converter on. I want to make sure that that's snug and then I've pushed the piston I've, I've twisted it all the way down and then let's see if I can do this the way that you you fill these will this fit Ooh, that's gonna be close you just stick the nib way down in there hopefully I'm on camera here so I've just I've literally stuck the nib all the way down in in there and then hopefully it will fill. There we go. Nice. It's a messy deal. I'm just going to I'm going to say that right now. These fountain pens are a little bit on the messy side when you're dealing with these, you know, uh, doing doing your own inks and all that stuff, but I think that's kind of half the fun for for <laughs> half the people. They they want uh, junk all over their fingers. So we'll just kind of wipe that off a little bit. Pop this in the body. And I'm going to cover this ink before I totally knock this straight over. There we go. And we have already tuned this. Uh, Chad, this is the one that Chad tuned. So. Oh, yeah, this thing's smooth. The quick 
And like I said, this paper is probably not particularly amazing. Um, you probably, I don't even know if you can see it. It's kind of blown out. Uh, is there a way to fix that? Hmm. Can't get to the controls on my camera. Let's see here. Hold on a minute. I'm going to try and turn down the brightness here. Maybe. Hmm. Why can't I get exposure compensation? Hmm. Profile. Well, hmm. sorry guys, I can't, I can't get, I can't figure it out right now on, on the fly. Brown box jumps over the, was it slow, lazy, lazy dog pretty good it's a good writer that's for sure and then you get ink all over yourself it's fun uh, but anyway just wanted to kind of share that not a bad pen huh Woo! all right and i'll try and hold this up so you can kind of maybe see it sort of. That's what I wrote. So it's definitely an orange ink. And uh, this nib, I'm, I'm pretty, sh I'm almost certain it's a, yeah, it's a, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, a Yovo. And I think it's a medium. I gotta get, I gotta get my helper glasses out because I can't even read that. So small. Pretty sure it's a medium. Yeah, medium. Medium Yovo. And uh, this one's kind of special. I don't know if we can get a, a shot of it. It'll uh, oof, it's gonna be tough. Um, the nib I'm gonna try and is actually engraved Schimmel pens. It's a S S P. Uh, we're having a little trouble here, but <laughs> but you get the point, right? Oh, no. It just does not want to focus on that. But anyway, I got myself a new pen. I'm excited about it. We got it inked. And so now it's time to make a new pen. So like I said, we're going to be doing a cigar kit today. Let me stop and go back and read. See, oh, I had, I had the wrong thing on my screen. Let's see here. I'm going to switch to this view so you're not just staring at that thing. Uh, no, those aren't the, the pre-made nib sections. Um, to be honest, I don't exactly know how those work. Um, that's, that's a real section. Um, uh, you know, like we, we actually did all the machining on that. Because um, we're, you know, the, the point was for me to go down there and kind of learn how to do that kind of stuff. So we, we didn't want to use pre-made stuff. Um, but they do have the pre-made uh, sections and I don't, I just, I don't exactly, I, I haven't asked Chad about how those can, like actually kind of work. So let's see here. Magma. Yeah. Yeah, that's satin. It's, it's nice. Um, that's actually the first one. That's the first one of the fountain pens that I've made, but it just, the feel of it is just nice. I really like it. Now, you know, I wouldn't do that on all pens. That one looks pretty good. Um, the nice thing is you can stop and see what it looks like because you're going to sand it with 600 anyway. So if, if you, 
you know, it's up to you, uh, really, uh, if it looks really good. The, the one thing is they're a lot easier to photo, um, you know, um, so put a little bit of, uh, especially like daylight on it. And, uh, you know, the colors will, you'll, you'll see the patterning a lot better and you're not going to have to worry about reflections and all that stuff. So it's much easier to photograph. Um, probably going to be a little bit better on, you know, video and, and all that kind of stuff a little bit. It's just easier to capture than something reflecting. But in person, a lot of times the super high gloss stuff really looks good. But like I said, in the, in the hand, I really like that a matte finish. Yeah, 15, yeah, satin. Um, I would actually call ours matte um, because, you know, 600 is, is a really low. But, you know, I mean, I could have maybe gone to like 100 or 1,000 or 1,500 or something like that. But I don't know that, I don't think it'd be any better. So really 600, why go any higher, you know, on, on most of this stuff? Oh, syringes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I yeah, I know it was from Visconti. They their Homo sapiens thing. Um it just it wasn't because I was copying that or anything. Um or and I really had no inspiration from Visconti, you know, that that pen. Um it just I for some reason I typed in like lava or magma or something like that and that actually came up. Um I think uh, in in the that that picture came up and I'm like, "Oh, Visconti. How <laughs> Yeah, I want to make a pen too. Um, so, anyway, let's see here. Uh, I'll switch to this view. We'll get to turn in. Yeah, so the next step, I need to get some notebooks. I, and that's another kind of tough thing. I, I'm not uh, entirely certain which, what I want. I'm going to get some, some good paper, you know, good paper for fountain pen writing and stuff. And I also want to kind of come up with a game plan um i want to start getting in the habit of writing more some somehow and uh, i need to come up with a a good reason you know give me something that that, uh, I, that i'm not just sitting there writing because i the thing is i'm not going to just sit sit around and write nothing uh, you know just just get you know because fountain pen paper is expensive um or like good, let's just call it good paper. There's, I don't know that there's fountain pen paper necessarily. Um, but good paper is kind of expensive. And if you really don't have any reason to do it except scribbling, uh, eh, I'm not sure it's really worth it. You know, like I won't, I won't do it basically. So I want to be purposeful. So I'm going to come up with a, a game plan. Let me get my phone going here. Let me zoom out on this a little bit. Got this dust collector rolling, so we got this thing. Man, that's loud. Whew. I'm gonna turn that down a little bit. All right, that's a little bit better. Um, so we got our, our between centers set up. This is a dead center and a live center and our between center bushings. Um, one of the things that I'm actually excited about for the metal lathe, like learning how to use that, is I want to make, um, you know, if I just need a one-off set of bushings, I mean, I have a metal lathe, we can just machine them. Um, the other thing is for the, you know, the kitless pen mandrels, um, these are okay, um, but you know, you kind of get to the point where you've got very specific dimensions of things that you want and, and stepping of, you know, drill sizes on the insides of things. Much easier to just make your own, and if you got a metal lathe, easy, you know, super simple. So it's not even just about making, like, like actually m m machining the pens themselves. It's uh, some of the other stuff, you know, metal lathes are pretty, pretty nice to have if you, if you can get one do a lot of different stuff with them all right let's get going here oh i'm on the wrong let's go back to youtube here so i can see the chat oh then i lost the thing here we go oh yeah that's a good idea kim
Yeah, it's interesting with that, that kind of matte finish. Um, I don't know if it's just because like most of the pens and things that I make are glossy, but the matte finish actually makes me want to like feel it, touch it, you know, more like just looking at it. I'm like, oh, and I'm, you know, so I think there's even something to be said for, you know, keeping it matte on the entire pen too. Tell you what, my family is going to be getting everything fountain pen <laughs> for birthdays and stuff this year. <laughs> I was at a uh, my, my nephew's birthday party yesterday. And I'm like, hey, do you do you journal? I was asking all kinds of people. Do you do you do a lot of writing? Do you have you ever used a fountain pen? One thing that was a little bit disappointing is I brought the pens that I've made, and I don't know. I think they're pretty darn cool. Uh, and like pretty much nobody like my mom was like she knows what was going on and I show my dad He always sees stuff in the shop, but like nobody else really cared and I'm like, okay <laughs> it's Funny when you bring something shiny out usually people are like oh, what's that? No, nope, not these people so it's looking pretty good uh, and I wanted to kind of stop real quick and Try and get oh there we go. get the camera in here a little bit closer just to try and get kind of a shot of this thing you know there there are a few areas where there's like some some variation in that color I think you know like if that gold was just mica powder I think it would look a lot different um, there's there's more happening in it um, and even the greens got some some kind of different striations of things but you know I'm gonna be honest, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not entirely certain that we're getting a, a, a massively different look necessarily, you know? Now I did use, let's see, I used a, did I use a black? I, no, actually, I think the tubes are uh, like a silver. Um, so, so they aren't painted, they're just, I wanted light to reflect more so they're like the nickel plating so basically they look like chrome tubes so just to kind of let you know what i did on the inside because if there is a big blob of just the dye stuff which actually right here you that's that's an area i can actually see the tube i mean it's it's almost imperceptible but i know what i'm looking for and i can see through to the tube right there so just be aware of that. If you're doing stuff like this with transparent dyes, um, you know, it's gonna, there's gonna be areas possibly in your blank where you can see all the way through and you'll see that tube. Yeah, fingerprints also, you're right. Although, the one thing that I have found is the, and I'm, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I think the number six magic juice, um, I would recommend, because I don't know that the number six really make, makes a huge difference compared to just going to the five, but I do think that it kind of cleans off the blank and it also kind of keeps them from getting too fingerprinty. So it's kind of a nice, kind of a nice thing.
Hey Tessa, how's it going? Welcome to the stream. How are you doing today? Yeah, so that trip to Phoenix was pretty short. I got there Monday afternoon and I uh, had to leave Wednesday, like early morning, get to the airport. So next time I plan to stay a little bit longer, but it was horrible. The, the plane flights there, I mean, the plane um, fares from Reno to Phoenix were terrible. And if I would have just switched to like, like, been one more day, and actually I was going to go down on a Tuesday, but for me to leave on Tuesday and come back on, like, Thursday, it would have cost, like, a thousand dollars. And I'm like, yeah, no. That ain't happening. As it was, it was 600. That's ridiculous. It's really expensive to fly out of Reno. Really doesn't make it very exciting. But I wanted to get this done, you know. I just kind of felt like I was at that point where I really wanted feedback on, on what I was doing, how, how I was doing things, and like I said, get a few questions answered. So, I bit the bullet. Uh, and it was, it was well worth it. Chad really really helped out a lot. I, you know, re realistically, most of what, like, the feedback he gave me on, and, and the, the qu answers to questions that I had were mostly, like, you, you know, I was doing things right, you know, or I did understand how this or that worked. So it's not like, you know, he was really, like, had to, like, teach me a bunch of new stuff, but it was perfect. You know, I got a little bit of a I don't know, you get a little bit more confidence when people say, okay, that's looking pretty good. And then uh, the metal lathe tutorial was, you know, I didn't know anything about metal lathe, so that was total instruction from him. And I mean, I, I literally got off the plane when I got back in town and like hit up our, our metal lathe. Kid Cooper, what's up? Rain or hail, huh? That's no fun. All right, so I got just a little bit of a bump at the ends there. Actually, this one's pretty pretty solid. I might just give it just a little bit of love right at that junction. And then this one needs a little bit as well. And you might notice I, I am using a, a standard cutter. Um, I, I'm finding that the the because so you know I always say that the, the negative rate cutters are amazing, and I, and I am definitely not going to you know go back on that assessment. Um, the negative rate cutters have you know they're 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 compared to the the regular cutter, which is dead flat. This is the regular cutter these things the thing is they're more aggressive but they also cut a little bit better and I'm I find that on the the, um, the kitless pens I prefer using this because it actually takes a little bit less force um, you know to uh, to get it to kind of cut and you'll get some ribbons and I can get a slightly better finish actually with this and so there's there's really no you know you can use standard cutters the problem is if you do get a catch these things are going to just rip your blank apart um, whereas the negative rate cutters they're much safer 
Um, I mean, you can literally just butt it up against it because it's a lot less aggressive. Um, and hopefully you can see the edge is kind of sloped down. So the, the cutting edge is not at, like just flat. It slopes down, that's the negative rake on it. And so these things are amazing. Um, and you know, they really transformed my resin turning, especially on larger things and, and doing, you know, hollowing and all that kind of stuff. These things are invaluable. So I highly recommend if you've never tried one, uh, the negative rakes, try it out, see how you like it. Um, they do a, an amazing job on, on resins and other difficult things. However, you know, you, you can still use the, the standard cutters, but you have to be more careful um, because if you if your technique is a little sloppy, you get, you know, especially if you get like roll, if the tool rolls a little bit, it can grab onto that blank. Um, or if, you know, you don't have it kind of set up properly, these things can kind of tear apart blanks, uh, you know, so just, just be careful, but you know, the standard cutters work just fine as well. Um, it's just, like I said, kind of a safety buffer. And I typically, I actually, I just don't really want to switch that cutter out. Um, but I'll typically use that, the, the negative rake on, on you know, normal pen blanks, like kit pen blanks. That's what I typically will use. Feels like I got a little bit of a bump there still. Let me look at this thing, yeah. I gotta take one more pass. Now, a lot of times when I'm taking like one more pass, I'll actually go from that cutter to my radius negative rake. Uh, the, you know, like a square. Because there's like, it's not gonna, you know, there's, there's no, um, it's not gonna tear apart your blank, right? Being a negative rake. So there's really no consequences. If you come back with the standard cutter and say one more pass, that could be the, the death blow right there, you know? So, and I like the, the radius cutters because it, I find it pretty easy to get, to, to kind of smooth out, straighten out the blank with that one. And you can just use this thing to turn with the whole, you know, from the start if you want. It leaves a pretty nice, smooth finish on it too. On your blanks, just not digging the way this thing is looking. Needed to be smoother. From front to end. There we go. All right. The smoother you can get it off the tool, the less sanding you're gonna have to do. So let's see how I did now. Drop my, dropping my air hose. Now this paper is called Mer Mer uh, Merca Gold Flex, and I'm really digging it. I actually got that recommended to me by Jim Hines. The problem is you got to buy this gigantic box. I don't know. Maybe there's smaller ones, but I can't even get it in the camera. Here we go. <laughs> so I bought this huge box of it and it was like 80 bucks or something like that. But um, you, I mean, this is gonna last me for like my life. Uh, and so it's got a little bit of a sponge backing and it's, it's really made to be cutting this type of material pretty well. There's nothing wrong with Abernet and I've been using that forever, but I, I actually find that I can get kind of a better surface and less I don't know, it's a little less aggressive for some reason and it still doesn't clog up, um, even dry sanding, um, as long as I clear it, you know, now and then. But it's not bad if you want to try it. The thing that I like about it is this, this little spongy pad um, and the, the type of paper, but um, it, it lets me not, I tend to put a lot of pressure um, when I'm sanding, which, which leaves deeper gouges, you know, the, the, the grit. You can kind of turn, 400 grit scratches into like 240 grit if you press too hard. And so I tend to do that a lot. I sand a little bit too aggressive and so that, that sponge actually kind of helps soften that a little bit. 
So it's kind of nice. I, I don't know. If you want to try it out, like I said, there, there might be smaller amounts that you can get. But it's just just something, it's not necessary, not a, not a big deal if you're using Abernet or whatever you're using. Uh, if it's working fine, then don't worry about this stuff. But if you want to try it out, that's that's what it is. See, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really load up as long as you, you, you're not pressing really hard or sanding at a high speed. As long as you clear it, it seems to cut the material quite well. Uh, it just, sanding is pretty quick with this stuff. That's, that's why I kind of like it. All right, now that's smooth as can be. Give it a little bit of um, side to side action here. Very light touch. Um, this is another area where you can really kind of gouge into the, the material if you're pushing too hard. And that's all we do with the with that. So the next step, I'm going to wipe it off. Um, you could probably just use water. I always end up using denatured alcohol. It doesn't the the alcohol is not doing anything. It's just the lubricant. But I don't know. I've just always done that. So that's what I do. And then we'll do a little bit of wet sanding next. I need to get a new piece out. So we'll move over to the Zona. Let me check the chat, see what's going on here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it is, it's really, it really is reassuring. Because sometimes, you know, a lot of us, um, you know, we're, we're, even though you're maybe online, you know, there, it's one thing to watch a YouTube video, then go to your shop. You know, you're not getting feedback from that. Like you're kind of, you know, this is one of the pitfalls I would say of like YouTube. Um, you know, okay, you learn things, but you don't have that immediate feedback. You know, especially like a, a good example is like learning how to just, you know, turn uh, using using wood turning tools. Um, you can get the okay. Here's how you do it. You know they can explain things, and and I, it's always useful to get the what not to do <laughs> kind of things. Um, those are always the good ones and safety and all that. But the thing is, like, if you don't have somebody that's kind of looking over your shoulder and and seeing like how are you actually holding this and and how's your body moving, and it's a lot of times it's really almost impossible for you to look like at yourself. Uh, you know, maybe you could videotape yourself, but even still, you are the one learning. You don't necessarily have the eye to, you know, change uh, something that you're doing. You may not notice um, that you're doing something wrong. And so that's just kind of like things like that, where, where somebody looking at you can kind of say, eh, you're kind of doing it a little bit wrong. Why don't you try, you know, doing this instead? Or just, you know, change this little bit, and then, you know, you've got the, the technique down. That's cool. Hey, how's it going, Barb? Oh, uh, I'll show you that pen. Um, I, I got it all finished up. And it's looking pretty sick, I gotta say. And the um, the cap works fine. Um, I still don't know what happened to that thing. Um, I, I don't know. Not entirely certain where the threads went, but I kind of jacked that up. Um, what grid is this? Uh, this stuff is the Zona paper. So it's like micro mesh basically, but um, it's cheaper and uh, I like it better um, being thin. And so the grit, you know, it, it, they give you a mi micron level. And so I tried to kind of convert that to like a, a P scale grit of sandpaper. It's a little bit of a different kind of animal than just normal sandpaper, but I believe this is somewhere around 750, the green. And then the gray is around 1150 or 1200, something like that. Um, so Zona is, I think it's only six pieces compared to like Micro Mesh has like seven or eight. 
So here's here's like how here's the the scale. There's green, gray, blue, pink, aqua, and white. Okay, and so you can see white is one micron. That is ridiculously fine. Uh, and then two micron, three micron, nine, fifteen, and thirty. So um, all oh, drop my drop my little cheat sheet here. All that I do is I go to like gray or blue somewhere around there, and I think the blue might be like twenty five hundred something like that. Um, I go up to that and then I switch over to the micro or the micro mesh, the magic juice, um, pla like the liquid plastic polish stuff. Uh, let me see here. So zone of blue is yeah about twenty five hundred on the P scale. And so and sandpaper gets a little bit crazy. Once you get up above like a thousand, then it doesn't matter if you're talking about the cami. I think that's the American scale and then the the European P scale. Um, but below that, it's it, I think it's pretty widely different. So I'm just using the P scale. Um, 30 microns is the green. That's around, I guess, around 700 grit. Gray is somewhere around, I guess it says 1350. So, but you only have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it's six on the uh, 3M, and you're getting actually, I think, higher like, like, frankly, they kind of work better and they're cheaper. So, uh, where, what was I doing here? And then here, okay. Went off on a tangent there. Old Man River. Yeah, put it on two times speed and then catch up and then it'll probably be right in line with us uh, going on the second one. Yes, the, the, the regular carbides can grab. Um, if you make a mistake, they are unforgiving. I, I, that's, that's a good way to put it. Um, you know, and, and that goes for anything, because they're just, they're, you know, the, the more angled up you are, the more the incline of the angle, the cutting angle, when you're turning, and I don't care if it's resin or, or wood or whatever, that's a, a more aggressive angle. And so the more tilted down, the less aggressive things are. And so that's what that's what's going on. When you hold up a negative rate cutter, it's angled downward. So you know you you hold the tool exactly the same as the standard cutters, horizontal, but that cutting edge is is already sloped down. And this is how you know back in the day, the reason these came about was people would start when they were doing resin turning, they would tilt the actual tool up to create a negative rake with a standard cutter and it's just completely uncomfortable. It, 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 turning that way is really, really weird. I mean, let me, let me back the camera up so you can, I mean, I'm sure you get the idea, but when you see somebody doing this, you're like, oh my God, that, are you okay? You know, it looks like they're, they're, I don't know, something's wrong with them. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit, but this is what people would do. They would grab the tool rest and they'd have the tool cutter <laughs> and you're turning like this. I mean, that's just not a good way to turn, right? So Easy Wood Tools was like, okay, why don't we just change the angle on the cutter? That way we can, you know, all the tools are used exactly the same. You know, you, you hit it right at the middle of the, the turning, you know, of the material, get your tool rest the height right, where you're hitting it right at the center line, and then horizontal. So you don't have to change the way you're using it. It was brilliant. Uh, it was just, it was really, honestly, when they came out with these things, it was a game changer. I was like, this is revolutionary. I was, I was all, all in on it because I could see the value, you know, um, especially when I used it. I was like, wow, that's, I mean, that's night and day better. So You're gonna get you some Merca. Merca's a really good brand. I mean, it's expensive, I'm not gonna lie, but sandpaper is, wire, is one thing you do not wanna skimp on. Do not buy Harbor Freight sandpaper. Um, the way that sandpapers and, and you know these abrasives are created, um, I mean, it, it goes down to the paper, the glue, the, you know, the, the adhesive they use to, to keep the particles on there, um, the, the particle size, how, what the quality control is, of the particle size. So you may, you know, if you're buying cheap junk paper and it says it's 400 grit, it may actually have 600 and 200 grit particles in there because it's cheap and the quality control is not very good. So it just doesn't pay to use junk paper and a lot of times it can just fall apart and 
Uh, it doesn't last very long at all, and it, it's just not a good thing. Merca is a good brand. 3M, Norton, you know, just buy something respectable. <laughs> you know, uh, Klingspor is a good brand. Something like that. Just, just don't buy the cheapest thing on the planet. You, it, you will regret it, basically. All right, I think I've sanded that to death. You're talking, not paying attention to what I'm doing. So again, light, giving a nice cross grain scratch kind of pattern but very light touch and i think that that is one of the most important things is to to you know you turn it on and sand it this way where you're creating radial scratches this way i really think that it is like imperative that you do the other direction where you do a cross grain i guess i don't know or with the grain <laughs> whatever but it's mainly what i'm talking about is like the scratch pattern is, is doing it the other way I think really makes a massive difference on plastics. Uh, most, you know, if you look at those headlight kits to, to clean up your headlights, they're gonna tell you to do that. So, you know, if things like that are telling you to do it, then, you know, it, there must be some science behind it. I don't, I don't know what the science is entirely, but to me, what can happen is if you're just following the same pattern, you know, of, of the same direction of, of grit, um, you may not be sanding the whole every piece because some of those particles can kind of just get trapped in a previous um, grit, you know, divot, <laughs> let's say. Um, and by doing, this is a solid surface, okay? So again, compared to wood, I mean, half the surface is kind of gone with the grain. There's, there's literally like tubes, microscopic, but, you know, it's tubes of, of wood. This is material from, you know, the, every part of this is material. And so doing that crossways, it gives you a, a hatch pattern of sanding scratches rather than just these these loops oops you know um going around yeah this is what i want to do so it's i think it's it's a very imperative thing to do that tons of good tips today i'm trying uh the gold flex was 400. if you can get a pretty good you know, you don't have a lot of tool marks and bumps and stuff. Uh, you can easily start at 400. I could probably get away with like six, um, six, 600. You don't want to go too high though. Uh, you want to make sure that there's no kind of, sometimes you can, you think you got the, the surface like flat, you know, where there's no like little dips from the tool, tool marks. Um, and then you get to the end and then, they're, you're, then they show themselves kind of. So oh, yeah, it, it's a fine line. 400 is not a bad place to start, though. A lot of times, as long as that blank is pretty, pretty flat, you know, not not a lot of grooves from the tool. I think I'm just going to stop with the gray. I, I don't know that we need to go super high before we start with the magic juice it's up to you um, there's different ways a lot of people recommend going up to like a 2000 grit which this is somewhere in there i guess this is like more like 13 or 1500 magic juice always comes through for me though I'd say gray or blue. I don't think you need to go any higher than the blue. <clears throat> Some people, this is this is thing a pet peeve of mine is you see people, they they'll go up to like, they'll sand to like four thousand grit and then go to like you know triple E buffing wheels, which is like more like a thousand grit. So you're like going backwards basically. Always try to go forward, unless you're seeing scratches, but you're kind of doubling your work if you. Go to four thousand, then drop back down to a thousand, and I like I like efficiency. I don't like sanding. Six. So these are the Magic Juice polishes. These things are great. Um, if you haven't tried them, the uh, Turner's Warehouse has a sample set that's like twenty bucks, I think, or somewhere somewhere in that neighborhood. I mean, it's under. I'm pretty sure it's under twenty dollars for the sample set. Um, most people that try it are really happy with this stuff. Um, it just leaves a really, really nice finish, and it's easy. Um, so, 
give her a shot if you haven't tried it. All right, so it's six steps and you just give it a shake. I like to pull out a slightly softer paper towel um, so that I find that the, 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 you know, the blue Scott shop towels are, are less abrasive than like white paper towels. I'm still trying to find like a paper towel that's almost non-abrasive have not found that yet but there are some you can buy like little wipes so one thing that is i'm pretty sure this is non-abrasive i don't think i have the box i got a couple options so there's these little wipe things and i think these are non-abrasive it's kind of a microfiber so that wouldn't be a bad way to go i'd have to cut this stuff up um, but these are not they don't rip you gotta watch out when you're sanding i don't think these uh, I mean, it kind of rips, not this direction. Uh, you know, so that's not, if it got wrapped up, I mean, it could get you in the finger, right? Now, another one is these scrub -its. I think these are, it's a microfiber, so it's probably not, you know, it, it, bare minimum, it's, it's going to be very low abrasion. Um, that's another option you can use. And it rips pretty well. I switched to this for step five and six, um, but I use the the blue paper towels first, um, going all the way up. The thing that I don't know, and this is, <laughs> I would love you know, there's like little little scientific facts that I wish I could figure out. I'm not sure how to figure this out, but I would love to know what like grit paper towels are because again it may not even be a big deal um i don't know it may not have like almost no bearing on this you know if it's really not that gritty but i don't know i get a little bit kind of nerd nerd out a little bit on some of this stuff so, like I said, I feel comfortable just using these blue ta blue paper towels. So this is step one. You want to be going about 2,000 or so, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000. Your mileage may vary. And you just, you don't need a lot of pressure or anything. I need to tighten up the, I think I need to add a little bit more here. It's kind of dry. Make sure I'm covering the whole surface. You just kind of go for for a while and then let it um, then clean clean it off, you know, with a fresh area on the towel. But I mean, just literally after step one, I mean, I could literally walk away. I've seen some people's pens that are supposed to be polished that are less polished than just step one. You know, it's looking pretty good. But we got five more steps to go, so stuff really does a good job. I don't know if you're supposed to shake it up. It just seems like anything that's liquidy probably could use a little shaking. I don't know. I don't know if that's strictly necessary, though. I find the number two tends to want to wrap up. Like, it's kind of sticky. You saw that. I mean, it actually literally, like, ripped my paper towel. I don't know what the deal is with that. I gotta talk to... What's his name? someday about that. And step three. Oh, that's one. There's three, two, three. Uh, and you know, with that gold flex, there's there's probably I don't know if Merca is available, not available in the, the like the UK or, or Europe. I don't know how what that deal is, but there's probably something similar to it with that has that kind of like spongy back. Um, so if you go to like your your dealer, local 
place that's got, uh, you know, if, maybe even if you can kind of contact a, a manufacturer, you might be able to say, well, you know, I'm looking for something that works like the Merca Gold Flex. Uh, and they may say, oh, we got just the thing for you. You know, it's not always about the brand itself. A lot of those things, oh, drop my, drop my stuff here. Um, they, they usually have kind of, what the heck is going on? Stay. Keep knocking the bottle off. Uh, you know, all, most of the, the big manufacturers, they're going to all have similar products. They should, you know. Uh, and then another thing, you know, I was mentioning possibly getting a, a different lathe. Uh, and I just want to touch on that a little bit. It's not that I need another lathe. It just, um, it's more of a want. This lathe obviously is just fine for doing <laughs> pen turning. It's a little overkill, but it works great. But... Um, I was kind of thinking about for like space and, and some other things. So I actually was looking at uh, a couple different lathes. Um, I'd never really worked on the Laguna 1216 myself. I've seen them, kind of played with them, but I've never worked on it. So I actually turned part of that pen uh, that I that we made. I don't know which part necessarily. It doesn't really matter. But I turned part of this pen that we made when I was down in, in Phoenix on the Laguna 1216. And then, you know, whichever, the other part, I turned on uh, the uh, Record Power Regent. Is that the right name? The big one. Their biggest one. And I, I got to be honest, guys, that Regent is a really nice lathe. Um, it's got some really great features. Um, I'm a little bummed. Uh, what I really wanted to try out was the Herald, which I have turned on one in the past but it would have been nice to turn a pen on one with you know with what i want in mind um i, I gotta be honest the, the the laguna 1216 is a great lathe um and i've i've recommended it before because i knew it was a, a pretty good uh, machine but i really you know like i said i got some hands-on on it um uh, uh, you know it's a great lathe great little lathe it's about a thousand bucks i mean you can't go wrong with that one i don't think and uh, the Herald, uh, it, like I said, it's a record power. Um, I was, they didn't have any. So those are already popular, <laughs> obviously, um, because they didn't even have any in stock there uh, or anything that I could, you know, get on and use. Um, but that's, I, I think they're trying to get the price tag down to like a thousand on those too. So kind of keep your eyes out a little bit. If you're looking at the Herald's, maybe wait a little bit. See if they can get them down because uh, that might be, I think they're trying to get it in that $1,000 price range. Oh, I guess I forgot to use the, we'll just do number six with, with this stuff. Like I said, I don't know if it really matters that much. Uh, but yeah, Herald is a great lathe and uh, the big record power is a nice one. And for people looking at dust collection, record power sells this little canister that I think would be a really great option for dust collection and kind of a, just a, a wood turning shop, a smaller shop, small footprint. Uh, and it's got excellent power though. Um, so we actually pulled one of those out of the box. Uh, I was kind of curious about it. So that's, that would be a recommendation if you're looking to get some dust collection going at your lathe or, uh, and it'll work with any, any tool, um, but it's, it's got a very small footprint. So lots of different stuff I learned while I was <laughs> down there. You got, yeah, you got the record power. Is it the Herald? H-E-R-A-L-D. Oh, Merca's a UK brand? Cool. There you go. Oh, or is it established? It's, they're over there. Which grit was I using? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm on number six for, for the magic juice. What I, what I was not, what I forgot to do, I, I like to switch to this stuff for number five and number six usually. Um, but it like, whatever, <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't really seen necessarily that even like, cause I used to use just the white paper towels and, uh, I mean, whatever, I, th I think it's okay. But I know that I know for a fact that the white paper towels, 
are definitely more abrasive than the, the blue ones because whenever I'm like sick or have allergies and if I, if I, you know, I'll just use paper towels when I'm out in the shop and to blow my nose and, and when, you know, when you're sick, if you blow your nose a lot, I mean, those white paper towels will just thrash your face. So that's it. <laughs> that's, that's the reason I know that, uh, the blue paper towels, not, not as bad. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that's kind of a ridiculous reason, but it is true. That's, that's how I know the face test look at that that's shiny so you know really really good um method that that magic juice stuff i i really like it and you don't have to like you know change around anything i used to buff and and there's still a thing for buffing um every once in a while um i need to use the triple e wheel to get some scratches out that are just persistent but for the most part for most things um the magic juice works just excellent without having to change over anything or mess around basically and it's pretty cheap you know like i said i mean that sample set's only 12 not 12 uh less than 20 dollars i'm pretty sure anyway i want to say it's like 15 i haven't looked it up for a while but it's good stuff good stuff okay here we go so we're doing the now this is the the kind of end the, the second oh i gotta lock my tail stock that, that'll help Okay. Let's see here. Ah, uh, the central, yeah, the Harbor Freight. Um, I mean, that works fine. The, the biggest thing with dust collection though, that you really need to watch out for, cause there's, you know, really cheap dust collectors out there, but it's the filtration. Um, because effectively, because I used to have, uh, I don't have it anymore, but I had like the one horsepower, um, you know, just one of those normal one horsepower with like the dust bag thing. And I, and I literally had it sitting right here behind the lathe. And I didn't realize that dust filter, I'm, I'm sucking in dust and it's literally putting dust, you know, particles back in the air because it didn't have good enough filtration. You want to get um, and I don't know what the, like, my, it might be like one micron or I don't know, but the, the, t today's, you know, good dust collection setups have good filtration. And that's the thing you, you know, unless the dust collector's outside, that's fine. You know, you can blow it out in the air, but if that filter's just throwing dust back in the air and that's the fine stuff, the dangerous stuff right so i'm like oh man that was terrible so now you know with my new dust collection system the oneida and this is something that you know most people are not going to stick in their shop i mean it literally cost me twelve thousand dollars with the duct work and the you know the cyclone unit there's cheaper ways to go but the main thing is even with the cheaper ones look at the the filter um, that's the important part it's not horsepower or any of those things if it's if it's just throwing the stuff back in your face then you have to wear a mask to be safe you know uh, and there's plenty of options that have good filtration and actually collect good you know chips i mean if it's got good filtration then the thing's probably pretty good at uh you know sucking the chips away the dust <laughs> so Oh, your live it's deforming the live center. They have live centers that, so mine, uh, they have them that have a carbide tip. Um, and also, you know, just watch out if you're, if you're pressing too hard, you can kind of dent that live center. Um, but they have carbide tipped ones. That's what this is. And it doesn't deform. So you might look into that. Let's see here. So hold on. I got to scroll up. I'm missing something. Flags, record power. 100. Oh yeah, so the which grit was I using? The 400 of the gold flex. Helsinki. Huh. That's cool. Okay, so I didn't miss anything. Why? Uh, why the 1216? Um, well, why not? <laughs> uh, if you need, well, okay. So one of the one of the problems, I so there's a couple problems. 
when I was doing, when, you know, I've, I've been doing the kitless pens and something that's bugging me is like the tailstock on this thing is like, I don't know how heavy it is, but it's not particularly fun to be, you're constantly moving that thing back and forth and doing a bunch of stuff. And um, I just don't need a 24 inch swing lathe to make, to do the machining on pens. You know, <laughs> just, you don't need it. And the other thing is a lot of times I feel like this may be a misrepresentation to a lot of people that you need some gigantic lathe. I bought this because I got a good deal. Um, I, you know, I, I worked with Laguna to get this and I got a good price on it. And so I'm like, I'm going to get the biggest one uh, capacity wise so that I don't really run into an issue. Like, you know, down the road, I want to turn a baseball bat and some, some bigger things. Um, this will do it. And that was, it was like buy the last lathe I, I want first kind of thing. Well, not first. I had a, a, a mini over there, the, the comment, but now I'm kind of like, this thing takes up a lot of space and I'm not turning big gigantic stuff. My focus right now is gonna be kitless pens a lot. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about making them. So, you know, it, and it's also like, you don't need some expensive lathe to do this stuff. You actually, you know, smaller ones may be a better way to go kind of thing. So I was thinking about getting something, uh, to, uh, another lathe basically that might be a little bit lighter, um, a little bit more nimble. The thing is, I'm also going to be using the metal lathe probably a little bit. So I, you know, I'm just, I'm just keeping my options open. That's all. This works fine. It's just a lot of it has to do with this heavy tail stock. It's not the easiest thing to, to maneuver around. And that's, I'm, I'm splitting hairs. I'm, I'm literally, you know, smallest violin kind of stuff. Yeah, but even if it's 25 feet away, Okay, this is the thing is people don't realize if it's in the shop and it's not, if it doesn't have good uh, filtration, even if it's not right next to your face, it's still spitting the stuff back into the air, into your shop. And it's, you know, so people don't realize that, you know, even after you turn the dust collector off, there's still stuff, you know, lingering in the air. You turn the machine off. So just, you know, air filters help with that stuff. But if you're going to buy, if you're going to upgrade is what I'm saying. Um, you know, I'm not saying you need to, everybody needs to run out and get a different dust collector or whatever. But if you're upgrading, just make sure that you're getting one with good filtration. That's like the most important thing I would say. Oh yeah, well, it, I yeah, 20 the tw the $20 ones are basically consumable. Um but I've had this for many years. Um the carbide it, and it literally it'll say that carbide tipped. Um and it'll it'll help you uh you know with that issue um because I was I had that issue. They they would get all dented and messed up. Heat also and too much too much tightening can kind of cause that as well, but Hey, how's it going, Lucy? Let's see, do I ever use a parting tool on acrylic to make grooves? Um, yeah, you can use you can use any tools. You can, you know, I, I use carbide because it's simple, <laughs> basically. Uh, but you can use any high-speed steel tool uh, on, on acrylic stuff or this, you know, this isn't technically acrylic. This is um, polyurethane resin. Um, but, but either way, acryl acrylic, any material, you could use a parting tool on for grooves and stuff for sure. I'm all over it today. I'm trying. Yeah, the canister, yeah. So like I said, it's just a matter of, and sometimes you can just replace the canister. Like it may not be that you need to go and um, replace your entire dust collector or anything like that. I'm just, be very mindful about the filter. And the, the biggest problem with this stuff is, you know, the stuff that you can see, the dust particles in the air that you can see, those are not the harmful ones. It's the ones that you can't see that are microscopic. You start breathing those in, in, your, in into your lungs and they don't come out. That's how, that's the problem with this stuff. It's, a car, it's carcinogenic. And so over time, the more the, of this junk that you're breathing into your lungs, the more damage you're doing because it never leaves. So everything you can do, you know, the first line of defense is, is you wanna have a good filter mask and you know, the RZ masks work fine, I think. I think it's good enough because one of the things is, you know, compared to like, um, well, you know, a lot of people, when I first started, like everybody used this thing, all right? <laughs> and like this, well, this has like the organic vapor cartridges, but this thing is not particularly awesome to, to wear for long periods of time. It's, it's not the worst, but it's not this, right? And so what ends up happening is people don't wear this 
I'd rather have, this is a little less good, you know, like the seal and all that kind of stuff. The, the RZ mask is probably a little bit less sealed, but if you're wearing it, if you're willing to wear it, that's better than not wearing one that's fully sealed, right? So it's kind of one of those things. The RZ masks work good or something similar to it like that. Um, get something nice and comfortable. So that's your first line of defense with dust collection or, you know, dust. Um, the second line of defense is a dust collector. If you can collect as many of the chips and even some of the dust, um, you know, collect it and, and get it, you know, into a canister kind of thing or, you know, collected. The last thing is a filter system. And uh, I need to probably do a video. I'm just really, I'm just going to be honest, guys. I've been kind of lazy a little bit. Um, see if I have enough length. The cord is so long. Ooh, it's really close. Really close. Um, a lot of people buy those ones that, like the air filter things that hang from the ceiling in your shop. Let me, I got to turn this thing. Um, the, the Stratus is an alternative type of thing. It's, it's an air filter for your shop. It sucks air in 360 degrees. It's all coming, sucking in here. Um, it's a really nice thing. Now, the only thing that I would say I don't love about it is the exhaust blows straight up, um, which sometimes it can actually cause dust to kind of move up. Any filter is going to have to exhaust somewhere, but that's the one, if there's something that I don't like about this, um, you know, model or the way that this works is it's kind of blowing the exhaust up. But um, the nice thing about this is it's on the ground. All right. And so people put those air filters in the ceiling. And the problem is all of that fine dust, you know, you just made some on the lathe or the table saw or, you know, bandsaw, whatever. The fine particles <laughs> are basically if you have the air filter up here, it's pulling them up right into your face. Right? So it's just not the most ideal way to do it. And I know some people just, that's the only place that they can put an air filter and there's nothing wrong with those ones. But for that aspect alone, this thing's a little bit smarter because it's gonna be pulling the fine particles that you can't see down. That's better. So you, and this thing you can just, you know, drag around and get right next to the, the tool that's making the dust. Um, rather than something that's just stuck in the ceiling, it's not moving ever, ever. you know, it's got to basically clear the entire room. Um, but this thing's a pretty good option. Um, you know, it's not cheap. Um, the other issue I have with it is it doesn't have a timer. Um, a lot of those other ones, you can just like, at the end of the day, turn it on for like an hour or two and just leave and it'll shut off. That is something that this should have, I think, but it doesn't. You can just buy a little timer thing though. Um, to fix that but so there's that's the third um, line of defense against dust and if you do those three things um, you know you'll be safe so there's my <laughs> there's my dust collection spiel spiel but again you know you want to you want to play it safe you don't want to you'd rather be doing this for the long run right you know and if, if you can just uh, take some precautions with the dust side of things um, then you don't have to worry about that, you know. You don't want to be, you know, getting sick or, or not being able to breathe. All right, so let's see here. Let me scroll down. Yeah, the big canister. 25 feet, yeah, the sound. I know, these things are not quiet. It's not very fun. Yeah, the traditional pen, you know, they, they can damage stuff. The, um, you can get those mandrel saver things. They can kind of help a little bit, but you guys know me. I don't, <laughs> I don't like mandrels. Steel Blade, what's up? How's it going? All right. Okay, I think I talked enough about dust collection and everything else let's get to turning let's turn this pen blank Woo. okay
Uh, one, one little other, other little tip for, for turning. If you need to make a taper on something, one way that I find, rather than trying to like angle the, the tool a little bit and all that, uh, you can do what I was just doing, because this, this bushing is a lot smaller than this one, so I kind of want to have a little bit of a taper going on. Um, but you can basically take like small cut here, and then take another cut that goes a little further, and then a, a little further, and, and you're taking basically the same amount of material. You don't need to take a huge chunk out. Same amount of material, but just take a small, you know, short pass a little bit, and then a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And then you can just kind of repeat that, and that'll eventually give you a nice little taper. I find that to be also pretty helpful with the kitless pens, because um, a lot of times that's all that's going on. You're talking like a few millimeter taper from one end to the other, and it's kind of hard to do that, you know, and so you can just kind of, kind of, uh, it's like a hack, kind of how to get that accomplished. Uh, one thing I do, I want to stop and mention. So, you know, I just pulled that air filter out, the Stratus, and I'm like, oh, this thing works great. Uh, you can see that I'm not using it uh, over here. And the reason being, um, that thing I like, it works really well behind my table saw, which causes, which creates a ton of dust. And um, my sanders, um, it's just, that's where I really need the help. Um, what I actually have, so part of my entire, you know, I told you I have a really expensive dust collection system. So my, this, this leg comes down and, and, and I have one on each side, but this thing is a, a, a giant vent down on the ground. It's, they call it a, a floor sweep because the way that they're, the, the technical purpose for this thing is you're, you can just sweep dust into this thing, which is super handy. However, that's not the reason for having this. It's exactly what I was saying. This does the same thing as that filter, uh, and it's quieter and I don't have to move it, <laughs> right? So I just use this, I crack this thing open, and I have a downward um, vent sucking dust down to the floor that isn't caught you know, up at the, the main uh, cone. So I just wanted to mention that. It's not like I'm like, oh, this Stratus is a really great filter because I am an affiliate of theirs. Um, and then I'm like, oh, I'm not even using it. It's, it's just, it's, it's redundant and louder, you know? So I, I already have enough noise going on on, the, on these live streams. Um, but I, I generally just kind of keep it over on that other side of my shop because that's where I really need it. Uh, and, it and I turn that thing on when I'm cutting pen blanks on the table saw and, you know, doing all that kind of, all that kind of good stuff, sanding things. Um, and that's what I really, where I really needed it. I do have another one of those vent things, but it's quite a ways away from my sanders. You know, like the floor sweep thing that I was just saying. And so I, you know, I really use that filter, that Stratus, um, when I'm doing sanding operations over in the corner. So just wanted to kind of mention that. I could see someone being like, uh, all right. I don't, I don't know. Do you really think that thing works? <laughs> Snake oil salesman?
Uh, and I, I use my air hose to blow uh, the, the shavings off, the ribbons off. Um, another really good way to go though, that's a little less blowing, you know, every time you blow dust around, that's also another problem because <laughs> you're just kind of blowing it into the air. Uh, I have no patience with those, those things, but another option is to use a toothbrush. Um, that, that can kind of be a good way to get those things off. So I don't, I'm, I like the air hose. I'm, I'm just, I've been doing it forever, but This, uh, this toothbrush I was using for, to clean off the, the cutting fluid, so it's pretty gunked up, but even still, see, look at that. Works pretty good. It's a little bit less messy. Cast your first burl today. Blurple and lilac, nice. That's a good one. Sweet. Did you post a uh, picture pics of that anywhere? bit of a bump there and there. A little bit of work to do here to get these things cleaned up on the ends. Just in your Facebook group, you gotta you gotta share that everywhere. You gotta see that. Are you on uh, uh, Instagram? All right, I'm like I said, I'm gonna come back with the radius square one. Oh, that's all I needed. I got that thing knocked out in one quick, smooth pass. That was great. Love it when that happens. All right, so let's stop and look at it. We'll get a little inspection, feel it. Is there any weird bumps that I don't like? No, it's looking good. Okay, on to the 400 grit. You get the media queen on that. I know, I, I wish my wife would post my stuff. I, I'm, I'm terrible at posting. Oh yeah, I was actually, I was gonna try and set up my iPhone when I inked that pen up. fail. I'm going to just capture some footage so I could post it on Instagram. I need a media department. Alright, I 
think that should be good. And like I said, do a little bit of cross grain, or whatever. Opposite direction sanding. Very light. You don't want to be pressing hard here. Okay. On to the wet, wet sanding. Shut the noisemaker up. <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, sometimes I'll, I'll pull out, you know, the... Well, there's a couple things. A couple ways that I do things. If I'm really, really going to be, you know, like if it's a really expensive type... Actually, I don't want to zoom in. Hold on. You know, depending on what it is. Um, especially on darker blanks um, that's the worst darker blanks show every scratch um, one of the nice things about magic juice is it kind of lets you get away with uh, you know not making it perfect let's say um, and the thing is you know a lot of people will will fret and, and worry about you know every little scratch but in most cases, I mean, if you can't see it, if it's not evident, and one thing that I'll, I'll say is if you can take the thing out and get it in like natural light, that's gonna be the probably the best um, to, to just like, you know, holding the pen. Um, but who wants to put the pen together and take it outside? So this light angling down and actually even turning this one off, um, if you can get a really bright and focused light and then angle it where it's kind of just bouncing, you know, like a, they call this a raking light. Then you can see on the surface very, you know, very well. You can see where scratches are and you'll, you just you need to get it angled like kind of the right way to see the scratch pattern, but they like stick out basically at that point. Um, and then, you know, I do have, these are like kind of like little magnifiers, like those are like a three times. Um, but if you really want to get nuts, <laughs> if, and I don't really recommend that anybody does this, really. If you can't see it with the naked eye without magnifying glasses, then, I mean, you don't probably need to get rid of it. But if you really are going to get anal about it, this will make you, you will lose sleep. This is going to anger you, frustrate you if you pull out magnifying glasses. I'm just warning you. But you could do that if you're selling like a thousand dollar pen. You know, and it has to be perfect. But let me tell you, there's no pen maker on the planet that actually really sells pens that, that's, that, well, I don't know, maybe there are some people, but if you're actually trying to make money selling pens, nobody's pulling magnifying glasses out for a, you know, $50, $100 pen. So just kind of know that. Um, the customers are not gonna jump all over you um, for, for, for that kind of stuff. In some cases, you know, yeah, I get down there and I really try my best to, to see um, scratches, but I'm, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. It's just not worth it, you know, in most cases. And like I said, blacks, darks, dark blanks, like this thing, I'm not worried about this. Um, the scratches are not going to show up on this because it's kind of a lighter color. Um, if, you know, dead black, like that, that, so, okay. <laughs> so the the one that i was doing the cap for you know so this one yeah I, I had to pull out some stuff because otherwise black you're gonna get to the end of polishing and then they're gonna be like sticking out like a sore thumb so i was really kind of getting down with the light and all that stuff but i didn't pull out magnifying glasses for those you know that's just crazy talk <laughs> You're, yeah, see, I, pr I prefer Instagram. Uh, part of the problem was I just got really tired of uh, a lot of the political stuff that ends up happening on Facebook. That that all that it happened during like the the lockdowns, the pandemic stuff. 
I think a lot of people kind of left Facebook at that time because I just didn't really care to hear about it. People complaining. Just seemed like less of it on Instagram. But it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm terrible about social media in general, so. I get like focused on something and I'm like, the last thing I'm gonna think about is taking a video or picture <laughs> to share on social media. The other problem I have is like, you know, people, I'm just not that good at being like, oh, I'm doing this thing. I feel like a lot of things that I do in the shop are just mundane and I, you know, like have to do it to get it done. Or I have so many things to do that, again, last thing I want to do is set up the camera. But, all right, so that's looking good. And like I said, I just kind of got down, looked at it, and, you know, tried to get in there. My up-close vision is terrible at this point, so for me to really see the surface, I'm going to have to put readers on at this point. But I kind of figure, like, if I can't see it, if it isn't sticking out with all these lights on, then I think you're good, you know? Yeah, oh, so yeah, for that pen that I just showed you, that black one, I actually did go to, uh, I hit it with the, the triple E, but, but I finished with Magic Juice. You know, I, then I brought it back over to the lathe and finished up with, I, I didn't do all the steps because they're, you're, again, you're kind of repeating um, grits. Um, so I, I do the triple E buffing wheel. I just find that that thing, I've, I know how to get scratches out with that really well. Um, I've been doing it for years. So the triple E buffing wheel is a pretty good one. If, if you, if you've got these persistent scratches that just won't go away, um, that's, a, that's a good, that's why I kind of recommend, you know, buffing wheels are a good thing to have. Um, but, but you know, the magic juice should, should suffice in most cases. Um, so I'll do the triple E and then the white diamond. Then I come back and do the number five and six with magic juice. Okay. I think I've ended that to death. I quit talking. <laughs> like thinking about triple E buffing wheels, not what I'm doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you a better shot of it. The, the problem is the, the lights over here are not particularly awesome. So at the end of the stream, I'll, I'll pull that one back out on the overhead camera where I can get a good shot. It is, it is worth your while to, to try to get, you know, to try and look and, and, and get as many of the scratches out. I, I would say, especially if you're, if you can follow the same schedule as I'm doing, you got a good, you didn't have leave a lot of tool marks in it. Um, 400 grit will get your tool marks out um, and get the, you know, get you on your, on the road. Um, if you can get the 400 grit scratches, you know, nice and even, um, and then the, the green one, you, you should be home free. Like if, if, the, if you can use the, the 750 to get all the 400 grit scratches out, then I mean, the magic juice should be good enough at that point, if you can get it up to that green level. But you know, every once in a while there's persistent scratches. The dark blanks reveal all Especially black. Black is the worst. I mean, you can just tear your hair out sometimes. And that's why I, I don't think it's worth, you know, being the, being the pen maker, you know where every little flaw is on stuff. And, and you know, most people are not going to notice any little flaw. Uh, they're going to be blown away by how awesome it looks. They're not looking for a scratch, like this one scratch that if you hold it in the right angle of light, it may present itself, you know. We do that. The the end users and, and customers don't typically. Um, so you, I just don't think in most cases you really have to worry about a lot of the things that we worry about. It's kind of the curse of having 20-20 vision because I used to when I, like I just recently started kind of getting to the point where I'm like, dang, I can't see anything. 
<laughs> so when I first started doing this stuff, I mean, I could see everything and I would just get frustrated and flip out about it. I think losing my eyesight is a, <laughs> it's a, it's a blessing, not a curse. Like, I don't know. I don't see any scratches. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what scratch? Looks good to me. All right, on to the magic juice. Six steps. One, two, three. Four, five, six. And there's other, you know, a lot of a lot of people like just, uh, and I actually just uh, picked some of this up to try it out again. Um, a lot of people like Plastex, and there's different ways that you can go up, um, you know, with, with sanding grits. You're going to have to sand to a higher grit probably before you use this. Um, I think that Magic Juice as a system, I, you know, with the six steps of all these things, I think it's a really good system. I think it, it gets... It doesn't leave you with swirl marks, which some of these other things that are like a one step or, or whatever, or only have like two steps um, can, can do. Um, I, I've seen people kind of run into issues basically with some of the other ones. That's why I was kind of skeptical about this stuff when I first tried it. But I, I like the six step system, but there are other ways, you know, there's Novus plastic polish a lot of people use. Um, like I said, the Plastex, I've seen a lot of people mention that on forums and stuff. So there are other alternatives, especially if you're, you know, in Europe or the UK or, you know, wherever, um, and you can't get access to, you know, some, some product. I mean, there's other plastic, there's plastic, all kinds of plastic polishes out there um, that you may try out, you know, and, and see if it works. Um, it gets tedious and it gets a little expensive sometimes, you know, buying all these different products. If, if you know, especially if you don't, if you haven't found a system that works, for you it can get expensive a little bit to, to find the system that that seems to work best for you um, but i would recommend i mean if you have a system if you've already if you're getting good results already there's really no reason to go buy you know another sandpaper and stuff um i think the magic juice like for 15 bucks or whatever it is for their little sample kit you know okay plunk it down but if you're getting good results with whatever method you use, I don't know that you need to go spend hundreds of dollars on a buffing wheel setup, you know, depending, like those types of things. Find what works and master it. All right, here we go, number one. If you're like me though, I tend to be like, oh, I don't know, maybe I should try that. <laughs> I say that, but I, I try new things all the time. I think we all do, right? You just got to watch yourself, because sometimes you can r fall into a rabbit hole where you really never get a good system because you're trying new one every other week. All right, so you saw how quick that is. I mean, step one, done. Treacherous number two. Always grabs me at the end. I overpowered it this time. I don't know what it is about number two. Gets sticky. All right, number three. I'm excited to see this thing put together. So for six steps, this, the, you know, the magic juice step goes quick. It's not like you're sitting here for like three hours messing around with six steps. That, that kind of, I got hung up on that. I'm like, six steps? Good Lord. All I use is two buffing wheels, usually. Um, and, I, and I still get really good results with my buffing wheels, but then I got to go over there. It throws dust in the air. That's one thing I don't love about buffing. 
Um, you got to wear a mask with that. Highly, highly recommend that you always wear a mask when you're buffing that stuff. You do not want in your lungs. Um, you know, so this stuff is a little bit more user friendly. And the thing was, though, I was getting glossier results. So for me to uh, for me to keep going with a buffing system, I'd actually have to go buy a different another third wheel. And I know a lot of people use the wax wheel. I, I don't wax. I won't use wax on pens. Um, wax breaks down with your, your, your hand oils really bad. Um, so it, it's not a great option. Um, but there are higher, let's quote unquote, grit, um, you know, buffing rouges. So I use the Tripoli and the White Diamond. And there's higher levels than that, much higher buffing rouges. Um, some of those, you know, if you guys listen to the, as the turn, as the pen turns podcast, I mean, some of these guys have like a four five, six buffing wheel system, which I think is ludicrous. I wouldn't do that. Um, but there's definitely higher grits. Um, one, one thing that I used to do actually, I, I have a, what's called a string buff. So it's like little string, I'm going to turn the lathe off so that <laughs> just, so they're little strings, it's super soft. These things are not cheap, but they're a really good buffing wheel. And what I would do is actually use Meguiar's 301, uh, what is it called, 10, 105. So basically I would use a, a pretty high high uh, polish, plastic polish, which I don't know what, what like grit level or whatever this is, but, but basically you can, you can just use a buffing wheel with like a polish plastic polish also so i could just use like maybe magic juice or something i think it'd be more economical to get like a big jar of like an automotive one it's probably cheaper but there's you know there's different ways to go but like i said for for the most part magic juice just worked so well for me that i'm like yeah i'm just gonna stick with this for most things if i run into a problem i can always pull the buffing wheels out Five foot nothing. <laughs> oh, you gotta get a pallet to stand on. I'm the opposite. I, I needed to buy like the the height kit for mine to get it up to where I need it. But it is important, you know. Uh, the right height can, you know, drastically alter your results. Um, but it definitely will will make things just easier. You know, like um, a lot of times if if you're not set up at the right if your lathe is not the right height, you're basically fighting it um, while you're turning. You know, you're, 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 the, the odds are stacked against you basically to get, you know, smooth cuts and, and, and to make it flow. You're, you're having to adjust your body into it, like kind of contort yourself into uncomfortable positions to get, you know, to get the, the, the cut, you know, get the job done basically. And so it's important if you got to put a pallet down do it definitely put a uh, a cover on it though so you're not stepping through the, <laughs> the slats All right, I think we are good, guys. I think we got it. Woo, that's looking pretty good. Check this out. Ooh, man. So, you know, like if I pulled out a magnifying glass, I mean, you know, maybe, I'm, I'm gonna throw on my readers real quick. So again, these are like a three times magnification i think or i don't know something some craziness that's overkill uh well okay so just looking with an overhead light i'm actually i actually don't see any scratches um, but i mean if i pull this thing out 
hold it and get get that well uh, you got to get it just right yeah I mean there's like a there's like a couple uh, you can kind of see some surface like swirls let's call it maybe it's really hard to, I mean it's really hard to see though let me let me get this light kind of a little bit better just for you know since you guys were kind of asking about this I got to get this thing in the right position though um yeah i mean there's a few in the purple but i mean you know i'm pulling a microscope out pretty much to, to be able to see this um just standing here under the light right right like this i mean there's no scratches in this i mean there's there's a little bit of you 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 wouldn't to the naked eye i mean there's so many other things going on with the the resin the mica powders and all that stuff that i don't think you'd even pick out any of those little scratches And I, I don't know. I don't even know if scratch is really even the the, the best word for, for what I saw. I mean, they're like kind of swirl marks more than anything here and there. All right. So let me get the... Yeah, this thing's going to look pretty good. Let me get the um, assembly tool out. Get you guys set up on the overhead cam right here. Might be kind of zoomed in, I don't know. I like to just put a little paper towel down for the parts in the pen, because there's probably resin or something. All right, so let's look at that. I got it nailed. Okay, here's our parts, our, our kit. So, and before I started, I, I marked the insides of these these uh, blanks. I don't think it really matters necessarily in this case. Um, I think you could just line it up however you felt it looked best. But basically like that, so I'm looking inside here. And I and I I just put so before I start cutting this thing up and doing all that, you know, on the the on the round blank, I had a little mark where I cut it, and then before I start actually turning though, I'll I'll get marks on the inside of the tube, and so I've got one, I believe right there. Uh, let me go and look under a light. I'm having trouble. Sometimes it's kind of hard to see where that mark is. Let me just look in here. Hmm. Really hard to see. Let's see here. Let me let me clean that out a little bit. Where's my lost my pipe cleaner. Oh, that's not good. Huh. Oh, maybe. Ah, there it is. Found it. Okay, now let me look again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's right there. Sometimes it can be hard to see. Okay. All right, so I got a mark right there. So I'm just going to leave that like up. And then this side, I got a mark right there. We're looking kind of like that. That's the correct layout for those things. And we're going to put, uh, we're, we're using a chrome cigar style pretty sure I got this from Turner's Warehouse they're available all kinds of places too all right Donna's here how's it going blemish no I wouldn't even call it a blemish um, 
like I said, it, it's so impossible to see that I wouldn't call it anything. <laughs> it's not. It's not really there. A real pen? You mean like an ink pen instead of a diamond painting? Because I think those diamond painting pens are pretty real. In fact, I, those are actually harder, I think, to turn than... Uh, definitely than like kit, kit pens. Uh, the hard thing with like the kit pens is just you got to make sure that you get the, the glue. You know, the glue the tube in correctly and everything's home free. Um, they're so short. Um, that there's just not a lot of, uh, you know, there's not a lot of problems going on. It's it's just the glue bond. Um, that's the thing that you need to make sure you you nail. All right, so we got our nib tip thing, and I'm going to take this off because I don't want that. I want to press that on. There we go. Looking good so far. Oh, and I need to put, put my ink in. Okay. And this thing, cigar cigar kits are great because you can pretty much assemble like the whole thing, and uh, and you just press the, you know, you don't you don't have to worry so much about the lining up. You just push this thing on whichever direction you want. So we had it. Let's see here. This it's it's going to go like that. That's lined up. So let's look at this and see. If there's any direction that we really like better. I mean, really, I kind of like this. Where I, where I lined it up, actually. I think we're just going to go straight on like that. I think that'll be pretty good. And then we just hammer it home. Look at that. Oh man, get rid of that little doohickey on the ink. Whoa, extreme close up. There we go. Not too shabby, huh? What do you guys think of that? So uh, let's see here. There's a couple areas like in the gold. I can definitely see, you know, there, there's a little bit more. There's more going on than just mica. There's there's more depth that, you, that in some of these areas. Um, right here, I mean, you can see straight through to the tube. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but and it's hard to tell. Like it's not because I used a, a, a nickel plated tube. But with the the light hitting it just right, you know, you can actually kind of see the reflection of the chrome tube right there. I don't know how to get this thing angled right, but um but you know, like I said, you don't you don't really notice it. I can see the tube right there. So there's definitely some striations going on uh that I can t definitely tell with the the yellow. Um I think with the blurple there's like darker lines here and there, and I, th I think that's probably where the dye is. There's just little darker kind of hints, but they're not really see-through or anything. And then with the green, I, I can see little, little lines of it. Uh, definitely right here, there's, there's like an area uh, where you, and, and right here with the yellow, um, you can see through. But so the other thing about that is you can kind of see some of the darker colors, that blue or, or purple, I should say. 
um, you can kind of see a little bit of depth. So, you know, it is a, it is a way to get a different look, um, you know, that experiment that we did. It's definitely a way to get a little bit more something going on with your blanks. And I think that the thing is, the, you know, depending on what color combinations, how you put them together, basically, that can really um, define um, how this is really going to work out in the end. Um, you know, so it's something to throw in your back pocket. You can always just, you know, mix up a, a transparent dye or whatever, even, even an opaque dye. Um, mix something up. Uh, here's another way to do it is just mix up a couple different um, mica colors so different shades of gold let's say um, and then just mix them together um, not not fully mix but you know like we did with the dirty pour dump one cup into the other maybe give it a little swirl and then when you dump it out you're going to get these these two different colors right next to each other but it'll just give that blank a little bit more something visually um, to look at you know rather than having a you know pour you know, a bunch of different colors, you can just dump them together and get kind of striations of different colors. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, let's see here, and last week's pen, I'll, I will pull that out in a second. Yeah, so the only, that's what, that's what I'm saying, the only person that knows about it and is gonna even notice it is you. And so, yeah, and that's the problem, you know, woodworkers, anybody that makes things, <laughs> we ba we badger ourselves to death we're like oh it's pretty you know you show something some project that you finish and everyone's like wow that's amazing i can't believe how'd you do that and then you're like yeah but you know i did this this and this and it, I, I had to fix this and we do it to ourselves you know the average person that like i said whether it be a customer or if it's a gift that you're giving it to someone or or if you're just showing it to somebody and it's you're keeping the thing um <laughs> if you just shut your mouth, uh, people will think that you're a magician, literally. They're like, wow. So, but there, but at the same time, you know, there are, um, I, I don't want to make it sound like, well, just leave the scratches in all your pens and nobody's going to see them. I mean, if it's visible, if I, if I was holding this thing up and, and it's just obvious that there's scratches, I did a bad job. You know, if you can see it with the naked eye and it's it's just sticking out like a sore thumb, then, you know, fix it up. Do the best you can. But there's no need to split hairs over things and pull out, you know, 10 times magnifications and all this kind of craziness um, to, 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 to see if you can find one scratch or, or, or some, some swirl marks. Um, if it looks shiny, glossy, and awesome uh, without uh, to the unaided eye, uh, again, one thing that I will say, though, is it's a good thing to take it out and, and see if you can uh, get some, some just sunlight. Um, it just sometimes things really pop out a little bit better than, than fluorescent lights in your shop. But, yeah, don't, don't fret over a lot of these little things. I thought I was starting with the easy one. No, diamond painting pens, the, the work holding is difficult. And then you have this, this long piece of plastic a lot of, you know, if you're doing resin blanks, um, it can move. I mean, a lot. Uh, so those are, I would say, harder to turn than, than these little, you know, than the kit pens, for sure. I would say that they're maybe even harder than um, kit list pens. I mean, you're, they're still, you're still not turning like a really long six inch blank, five or six, all at, you know, being held by, by centers. Um, there's a lot of um, bend, flex that can happen. It makes it a little bit more difficult to turn. <laughs> um yeah i just finished up last week's pen i think um yesterday actually that's that's why i i didn't mention anything okay so let's uh oh yeah trend the trend air shields are nice um yeah that's and, it, and they actually cool you down a little bit especially like in a and during the hot season let's see here Hey, Dave Sloan's here. How's it going, man? Uh... Yeah, and and that's you know uh, Donna was saying you know we're, we 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 are so close you know we're we're like turning and we're trying to get like this shape and like we're getting into this thing right as the maker and and we're very close to it but most people 
don't get and they're like oh you know pulling out a, a, a jewelry loop and they're like is it perfect they're like wow look at they're like holding it a foot away at least from themselves and and they're they're gonna write they're writing with this pen they're not sticking it up here you know so we get a little crazy as makers it's pretty funny uh let's see here Oh, don't you worry. I have barrels that hold Jowo. Yovo. <laughs> uh, it's, it's when you read J-O-W-O, -O, I got to say Jowo. Uh, yeah, I'm already making fountain pens. I've, I've di I'm diving deep into uh, Let's let's. I'm not going to ink it up, but I'll put a nib in it for you. Um, ooh, gold might look kind of cool. Where's my gold nibs? I need to get nibs. I need to buy a bunch of nibs in different sizes. Yeah, so down the road, I'm gonna be, um, I'll actually sell some of these things. Still still working out my design a little bit. Ooh, <laughs> that is pretty wicked. I real. oh man, I really love these colors. I like that gold, man, that gold nib really really sets that thing off and i got it lined up let's see so this is a triple start there we go so we got we got everything lined up with the patterning as you know as good as you can but it's really hard because i got it really polished i told you i actually pulled the buffing wheels out on this one so like pretty much um i have too many lights in the shop and they just all just bounce off this thing because i actually did i'm gonna i'm gonna go against the grain and say I did a pretty darn good job buffing this being black. It's really hard to see anything. Let's see, let me hold it up like this. So, and uh, we were talking about it, uh, CJ from CJ's Hobbies, um, he, he had a, the, right, um, the right name. So it's, it's Maki E, I think is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, but that's what I was trying to think of is it reminds me of the, the I think that's how you spell it. Um, that's a Japanese um, like art. I don't know exactly what that means, but usually there would be like you know like a crane, and it's but it's these like really vibrant kind of lacquered colors. Um, it kind of reminds me of that. It kind of reminds me of like fireworks, sort of. I was I was inspired by like like neon uh, like neon lights. That's what I was kind of going for. So eventually those blanks will be hitting the, the store. But like I said, I wanted to, I, I found that like on the back, it's very dark. There's not a lot of the color back here. And I'd like to kind of remedy that on the next batch. And hopefully we'll get color everywhere. So they're not ready for prime time yet, but. Do they have brass nibs? Um, I don't think so. You got gold, so I, I I am not an expert when it comes to this, but there's you know like a, a you know the gold gold colored nib. This is a steel nib, but it's it's a gold plating of some sort. Um, there's palladium, I think. There's titanium nibs. There's gold. Steel is the most common, and they're the most economical, and they work fine. Um, again, I'm not a fountain pen expert though, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But I, aren't you, you know what you're talking about? Brass nibs? I don't know. So yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm diving deep into the fountain pen realm. Um, I, 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 the, the big reason initially why I wanted to get into this is because I started pouring vertical pen blanks. Um, most of the ones that I, pretty much all of them, well, most of them, I should say, I would pour um, horizontally. And that's fine, but I and I would do five inch, you know, blanks. But now I'm I'm pouring them into vertical molds um, for the round blanks. And part of it has to do with, uh, you know, the, with with all the shutdowns and everything with the supply chain. Resin costs went up, and I'm like, okay, well, if I'm not the the problem with making a brick of pen blanks like this is I have to cut every one of them out, which means I'm cutting out an eighth inch <laughs> six times or uh, five times, I think. And then I would actually cut each edge of each pen blank. Um, so, you know, the amount of waste just by cutting it 
is phenomenal, uh, basically. And the time that I'm wasting cutting these things um, is, is pretty significant. And then the other problem is you have square blanks compared to a round blank. And so um, the problem with that is you, let's see here. You've got corners that you're just wasting. So the amount of wasted resin, I don't know if I can get this to actually show, but you know, the, the corners basically on this thing, that's not working very well, but you know, the, the corners of, of where the round is. Um, you're wasting a ton of resin. And so, you know, one of the ways that I thought might help me to not have to raise my prices because the, the price of, of Alumalite probably went up 35% or so and so you know eventually you got to raise your prices and so i was thinking about ways that i could not pass costs on to customers <laughs> basically and so i was like well if i start pouring vertically and don't have the corners and i'm not wasting time at the table saw um you know making dust basically and cutting all the the material away then um, that's a way that i can kind of keep my costs a little bit lower um, and so I, I got into the vertical pouring and then i'm like you know it would be really cool is if I just started making these fountain pens because they basically show off the blank better than anything else. Um, and I was interested in making them, you know, anyway. Um, but what ended up happening was I got into fountain, I, I got into making them and then I'm like, you know what, there's no way that I can sell any of these things if I have no clue what's going on with fountain pens. So I've been learning um, a lot about fountain pens and kind of, I really got in, I'm, I'm into it now. Um, I was... The reason I stayed away from fountain pens before was because I didn't know anything about it. So I'm not going to make one and not know what's and try to sell it to somebody and not know, you know, how it works even or how it works, you know, any of that stuff. So anyway, it's pretty fun, though. I'm, I'm having a lot of a lot of fun. It's really kind of reignited uh, my passion for pen turning. Um, I just I absolutely love doing all the machining um, I love being able to make the entire pen out of my material. Uh, it's just, there's so many things about it. And I'm starting to absolutely love fountain pens. So it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm having a good time. You haven't used a fountain pen yet? Well, I had never used a fountain pen until I made, uh, and this was, a, this was a funny thing. A lot of times, there's a lot of pen makers that literally like they haven't, I don't know, they'll make like a hundred pens and they haven't even made one for themselves. Um, or, or whatever. A lot of times makers make things and end up not having any of those things. It's like the shoemakers, shoe, you know, I don't know what that saying is, but like the shoemakers kids don't have shoes or something like that. Um, makers don't end up keeping the things that they make, you know, like they may sell everything or give it away. Um, and so that's how it goes a lot of times with, with I, and I didn't keep a bunch of pens, um, you know, when I was doing the, the kit pens, but with this, with fountain pens, the first, uh, well, this is technically the second one I made, but this was the first one that I was actually happy with. Um, I kept this for myself because I'd never even used a fountain pen. I'm like, I should probably like try it out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see how this works <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Uh, my handwriting is a little bit better. I, I, I find that I, I'm more, um, I don't know, I get into it more uh, using a fountain pen. Uh, but the problem is um, what I've been using it for is for my pen blank orders, I've been write, I write a note. And the problem is the copy, the printer paper is so terrible with a fountain pen, even with a ballpoint pen, that paper is absolutely horrible. And so I need to get some better paper. Um, it's gonna work a lot better. Oh yeah, I already know about Goulet. I'm, I'm, well, and, okay, so I've subscribed to Pen World, uh, Goulet Pens, uh, Fig Boot, um, like all of those things. As the Pen Turns podcast, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, that's a good one. Um, those guys talk, uh, those guys talk a lot of, they, they go on tangents, uh, I would say almost worse than I do <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> talking about their home renovations and God knows what, but um, that's a really good podcast. They, they really cover um, a lot about the materials. They, they cover a lot about uh, making pens and different, you know, lots of tips and different kind of uh, things that go along with it. So anyway, guys, I appreciate you all coming out. Hopefully you enjoyed watching this thing uh, get turned up. Uh, and hopefully you enjoyed the, the experiments. Um, so that was, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been doing these experiments. That's what this was. 
um, it was one of those blanks. Um, all of the subscribers, um, so for the pen blanks uh, or the, the blank subscription, um, you guys are gonna be getting one of each of the color combinations. Um, not, not all four, not one of each blank, but one of each of the uh, color combinations. So be looking for those things coming soon. Um, we're gonna be doing some more stuff. So again, I'm, I'm super into fountain pen making right now. And so uh, I'm gonna be continuing on with that stuff. We're gonna mix in a lot of, um, getting into making the fountain pens also has spurred on even more design ideas because I have a lot more latitude um, with certain designs. Now this one, it doesn't matter, you know, this would work excellent for kit pens, um, uh, kit list pens or whatever you wanna call them bespoke. Um, the big thing with kit lists or well, I'm sorry the big thing with uh, the kit pens is you have to watch out we're you know I've been talking about the tube seeing uh, you know with these these things with the dies so that's always something to consider um, and and I used to always try to make things as opaque as possible with my blanks because my main focus was you know traditional like the, the kit pens you know that have tubes however you know it, when you start doing something in a different form factor then you're starting to think like, oh, this would be really cool if you could see through here and there or, you know, so um, what I'm going to be doing down the road, just to let people know um, and try to make it as, as, I don't know, as easy as possible, or, you know, uh, on my website, um, what I'm going to be doing is all the round blanks, whether or not they're transparent or, or, or not, I'm going to be calling all the round blanks artisan, I think, blanks. I think it's kind of a not the best thing to call them like bespoke blanks because I do have a five and a half inch and an eight and a half inch in most of them. So I think I'm just going to title them artisan blanks, which is just a, a silly word, but it'll define something different where it's blanks that may have like very transparent areas in them just so that people can kind of identify the differences. Hopefully that'll work a little bit. I don't know, but down the road once i expand a little bit further that's how i'm going to kind of differentiate these these vertical it, it'll let people know the artisan blanks are poured vertically they're round most of them are going to have a five and a half and an eight and a half inch uh, you know bespoke length um, but they may have a lot more transparencies to them in some cases so it's just one of those things that i'm going to try to do that for people it's probably not going to work 100 percent, but anyway so Oh, uh, Cooper, you're driving to work? Okay, I'll send you an email, man. No problem. Oh, thanks, Tesha. I, I appreciate that. All right, guys. I'll quit talking at you. I hope you guys have a great evening tonight. Next week, we will do something. One of the things that I want to do, I was kind of going uh, talking about this, um, is I want to... Uh, somebody came up with a good idea, which also um, is going to factor into Turner's Warehouse uh, as well. I think we're going to maybe start kind of doing this big round robin. Uh, but what we want to do is come up with like a theme, an idea, similar to, I was saying, the inspiration for this blank was like neon lights, right? And I didn't really have a picture or anything. I just kind of had this ambiguous idea in my head. Um, but I think what we're going to do is um, working with Turner's Warehouse and probably with we're going to have to figure out how this is all going to work, but down the road, we're going to come up with, this probably isn't going to happen next week necessarily, but just wanted to give you an idea. Um, Turner's Warehouse is going to come up with an, an idea um, somehow, and it may be, we'd like to try to get it to be a community um, driven, like, like generated idea, but, or at least voted on something. Um, it's very ambiguous, but down the road, uh, we'll have kind of a special blank where on the stream, we take this idea and hopefully what we'll do is get a picture um, that we're kind of working with um, that has certain colors in it. And then I'm going to try to create a blank that is, um, you know, utilizes those colors. And then we'll, um, you know, go through, probably make a kitless pen on the streams, but also it'll be like a short run, a limited edition um, available at Turner's Warehouse. So that sounds like a really fun plan. <laughs> I think I'm really looking forward to that. So hopefully we'll get on that sooner than later, but um, I'd like to do some more of that stuff where we can kind of work on coming up with some blanks together, uh, make a, 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 a pen, uh, hopefully like a, a you know a, a custom pen out of it, and then have, a, have blanks available for you guys to get. So 
anyway, that's kind of coming down the road. So I hope you have a great rest of the weekend and uh, we'll be back regular on Saturday. So again, we did it on a Sunday this, this weekend because I had a birthday party to go to yesterday for my nephew. Um, so we're, we'll be back in action Saturday, 2 p.m. Pacific time and it should be pretty fun. We'll be making some blanks. So anyway, guys, have a great night. Thanks for joining the fun and I'll see you guys